Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for coming back in uh, so promptly. We'll get underway with our uh, second and final session. Um, just a couple of things to uh, mention. Um, one of my slides uh, had a bullet point which said that the uh, full reports for these projects will shortly be available on our website. When I said shortly, I was of course implying that it would be quite soon. I didn't know that it would be happening within a matter of minutes, but I do have a text message. Annex 10 final reports are now available online on our website. I wish you a successful end of Annex seminar. That's from Andre Yedish, our um, operating agent. So you should find all the project reports about these projects uh, at, at our website. Um, so please uh, take a look um, uh, at your convenience when you uh, get back to uh, the base. Um, the second thing I'll just say before I um, introduce the first speaker is you will see that at the end of this second session there is a thing called a surgery session. Um, this is an opportunity for questions and answers um, and this will be really very much uh, down to uh, you as an audience. Uh, I will um, take uh, questions generally from the audience but it is also an opportunity um, after that finishes if anybody wants to see us on a more one-to-one -one basis, particularly I'm thinking about countries which are not members who may have particular questions that they prefer to ask directly one-to-one, -one, then uh, there will be an opportunity to do that um, as well. So uh, anyway, that's at the end of, of this session, but we've got some fascinating uh, presentations to come first of all before that. So the first of those two remaining presentations is this one here, experiences with the potential of low temperature district heating. And with that in mind, I would like to hand over to uh, Sven Svensson here from the Technical University of Denmark. Sven, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this is the presentation and uh, the background of course is that we had this uh, call for projects and we were successful in getting this. And the aim of the project is to bring experience, knowledge, and solutions for the fourth generation district heating system to a level where they can be readily implemented widely. <clears throat> and uh, the strategy behind this is to say, well, this is a, some activity we have, not a lot, but if we can promote the idea that this is actually uh, something already there, it's easier to sell, uh, easier to make uh, recognized. So that's the idea. Uh, we want to uh, distribute information about this. And I have been proposing low temperature district heating for the last 15 years for the industry. And it's really nice to know that uh, today, in Denmark at least, all district heating companies are 
talking about, we want to have local alternative to teaching because it's a simple way of getting our business better. So the, the whole concept is to make collaboration, uh, distribute the information we have, uh, collect information we don't have, and make it available for those who want to make use of it. So it can develop in a, in a more efficient way and make uh, the, the final solution for our energy problems to, to make sustainable development in the energy system. The participants are indicated here. So we have uh, from uh, Sweden, Halmstad University, Svenjana and Urban Olsen. We have a uh, technical university of Denmark, uh, Technical University Dresden, and uh, British PRE and SSE, the Scottish Sour Electricity. So that's the five participants who have been working on this project. We have been sharing information. We have been uh, very lucky to have some groups that could do more in one part and, and contributing to this part. And, and uh, example is that from the German group, we had this expertise on Legionella, which is one of the main uh, problems to be solved in low temperature district heating, uh, with a tremendous amount of data that was uh, to be useful in, in how to make this um, policy available. We also have a link uh, to other activities. Uh, earlier Danish projects is called EUDP projects, uh, where we demonstrated uh, earlier on um, low temperature concept in new buildings. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, since a couple of years, the strategic research center in Denmark about the fourth generation district heating. We have uh, of course, uh, link to the new TS1 Annex and to the new Annex 11. So, Annex 10 is uh, bridging uh, early activities to new activities. We have this uh, picture which is not really easy to see, but this is the first, second, third, and fourth generation. So, here we have the fourth generation district heating, and what is the concept of that? Um, we want to have uh, the buildings uh, being heated for space heating, and we want to supply the buildings with domestic hot water uh, based on low temperature. So we have to do something in the buildings. Um, new buildings easily can be prepared to make use of low temperatures. We can uh, make existing buildings controlled in a better way, so low temperature it is possible, and we can cool down the return temperature uh, much more. So I think the, the really important uh, new thing for uh, district heating is that district heating is not just ending at the entrance of the building. It should be looked at part of the building heating system and domestic hot water system. And, and, and that is uh, where we can have easy improvement. So if the district heating concept is kind of being seen as an integrated part of the heating and domestic hot water heating system of the buildings, it's much easier to make the whole system work much better. And I think that uh, is something which is being understood, but still some district heating companies have a little bit of reluctance to, to go into interaction with the consumers and the users, because it's more difficult because you have to have another attitude. You're not just an expert and say, this is how it is. You have to behave in a different way and interact with the consumers the way they, the way they work and the way they think and the way you can do it. I think that's where we need to do a lot of things to see the building and the district heating network as an integrated part. Network heat loss. That's, of course, the main challenge. Uh, we have, uh, in future, much lower energy consumption in the buildings. We have to be doing something about this because otherwise we will have a tremendous big fraction of the heat loss uh, taken.
taking part in the network. So the network will be inefficient. So we have to improve the uh, network in a way that they are uh, much more efficient. And of course, district heating has from earlier time been waste heat of no value distributed. So this of course has to change a lot. We have to look at how to make the networks really efficient, provide the temperature you need, power you need, but without uh, losing uh, the energy which has been provided by sustainable energy sources, which has uh, in future higher value and, and cost for the, for the society and for the users. Uh, low temperature, 55 degrees in supply, 25 in return, or even lower combined with heat pumps, electrical supplementary heating, is one way to lower the heat loss, of course. If you can have a temperature difference to the ground, which is only half of what we typically have today, the heat loss will be the half. That's what's readily available and can be done in existing systems. Of course, you can also, in new systems, you can have, when the houses are using much less uh, power, you can have much smaller pipes. Of course, it's a challenge for the person who is responsible for making sure that you have capacity enough. So you, as an engineer, typically say, okay, this is what is necessary, and then I add some for risk to make it a little bit bigger. But engineering is not that simple anymore. Engineering, good engineering in future is to find the, the real minimum size of the pipes. Because if you just make it a little bit bigger, you have much more heat loss than you need to have. Insulation of pipes is a very, very difficult thing. You can add more insulation and you will add more area and you'll have almost the same heat loss. So what really, really helps is to minimize the internal pipe sizes. Then you can minimize the heat loss without any cost, even cheaper. And it's mainly about understanding that the energy you need to transfer is only so small and therefore you can do that. And, and of course, to have some kind of robust solution. The, the low temperature district heating has this nice solution that you have an inbuilt security. So when you are a little bit uh, in, in, in breaking uh, down the rules and saying, okay, we want to play the safe side, but go, but you are now daring going to the border and make the pipe smaller. Then, of course, you can always have the, the solution that in case you, in the cold winter time, have to supply more than the pipes can do, you can rise the temperature in a short time. It doesn't matter. The heat loss from the network is what takes place in the 8,000 hours. So if you, in a few hours in a year, have a little bit higher temperature, that extra heat loss is not important. So it's very nice to have this solution that you can have the benefit, but you don't really have a risk because if you have lack of capacity, you can always increase the temperature in the network, and this way you can make the network safe. So many new possibilities are uh, to be used in designing low temperature, low heat loss, uh, very efficient networks. Of course, we want to combine uh, the district heating in the future with renewable energy and waste heat. Uh, it's always been like make use of uh, energy, which is not used for anything else. Waste heat from power plants has always been a good uh, solution, but in future you don't have um, fossil fuel power plants, you have other sources which you have to uh, find and find out how to make use of, and of course you have a challenge that you're not in total control of your power supply and your heat supply. So, so you have to be um, investigating how to do this. And of course, district heating is a thing that only comes through if you have all the organizational things, the planning, the how to organize it. So that's important to know. So if we can improve district heating concept to make more efficient by lower temperature, smaller pipes, uh, making use of uh, fully renewable uh, energy sources for the future and have the 
organization that can implement that, we have a concept that will make the dispute heating a very nice solution to have in combination with low energy buildings in the future. And of course, if we can furthermore kind of uh, make this information uh, from those who are already engaged in doing something and make this useful for um, the companies who, who are not still uh, in this business in, in those countries or in, in countries where this is started as a new. In, in, in some way, I'm a, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting for many countries which don't have a lot of district heating today because they have a chance to build it right for the future. In Denmark, we have a lot of district heating, but face it, it's old district heating. And some of it is still there for many years. So we, we have a much more challenge to find the balance between what should we keep uh, and what should we replace and where we be, and where do we have the chance to build the right new suit. UK is a, a good country because they, they can make it right everywhere. We hope. So um, advances of course is um, Reduced network heat loss, uh, low temperature uh, can be made use of uh, in the buildings, it reduced thermal stresses and degradation, so the, the, the lifetime of the district heating network will probably get much longer. And, and uh, when, when we talk about district heating technology, the best technology today, uh, no one really thinks that this is going to be great for the next 30 or 50 years. So you may have district heating technology in the ground which is staying there for the lifetime of the building. So it's, it's something which is uh, very long term, like the buildings are, and, and, and this is good, and this is how you can get a good economy. Um, you can get a lot of, lot of problems related to high temperatures, uh, leave that. And, and the, the real benefit is that having this uh, low temperature also improves the possibilities to make use of heat supply uh, from, from low temperature heat sources. Many sources, uh, my favorite idea to just illustrate what is the, what is the history of heating heat source in the future. Well, the supermarket has a refrigerator. It's leaving the hot air, it's, it's, uh, the, the heat from the refrigerator is put to the air in a noisy way, and it's much easier for the supermarket to deliver that into a water pipe in the basement. And then it's this heating source, because you can make use of that 40 degree, 50 degree hot water from, from the from the heat, from the cooling machine. So just one example of saying, yes, everywhere in the society you have waste heat and you have, of course, renewable heat sources and, and, and you can make use of those. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, is to find the cheapest one. And, and I think the important thing is to remember to say the cheapest one on the long perspective, because if the system is all long-term planned, you have to have something that's not just for a short term, and then you have to change it again. You should think about what is the safe solution for the long term. The main questions to be done more research about is, what's the real the main advantage of this technology? Why should we really do it? Um, and what are all the possibilities? Because most certainly there will be a number of new technologies that are better than existing technologies and, and therefore we have to be open-minded and, and not just go on using the, what we are normally doing. We need to find a solution uh, for Legionella if you're working with low temperatures. I think we need to find a solution for Legionella in general. We have a Legionella problem for day. People are in every country dying to some certain few numbers so it's not something we are creating, it's an existing problem. I think if we can come and say, 
we want to have a more secure solution of that problem. We are not going on compromises. That's not what we want to do. We want to say this is this is a problem, existing problems. No one really wants to touch it because uh, then you probably get responsibilities. So people generally make a low profile when when you do something about the dilemma. I think we should say, okay, let's face it, let's do something where we are sure that this is a really, really good solution. The technical example of that is that in many countries, in Denmark especially, we have a lot of domestic hot water tanks. 100 liter, 200 liter of tank of domestic hot water, staying there for many days in average at some temperature. If that temperature is not kept warm enough everywhere in the tank, and the tank is having a nice environment for growing a bacteria uh, surface on the, on the inner side of the tank, then of course you will have a problem. So let's get rid of those tanks, because they are the source of Eglonella. Let's get rid of those that long circulation pipes in the buildings. Let's produce the domestic hot water just where we want to use it just before the tap, in the flat, short distance, have it at once, no big storage tank, no big circulation systems, and have a local production of domestic hot water, no volume, no time, and you don't have a problem. That's the most secure way of avoiding it. So we can, we can offer a solution which is uh, probably much more secure in real operation local production of domestic hot water in a flat heat exchanger. Every flat. And, and that's the way we can make use of low temperatures because then we don't need to have 50 degrees, 55 degrees, 60 degrees, depending on what is the local uh, requirements. If you have a system with a tank, you can, you can use the 40 degree hot water, which is what you need for comfort. So that's an example of combining security concerning the Gunella and benefit for the performance of the system. Of course, some distributing companies say, but our system cannot cope with distributing heat exchanges because then you have a peak load. But that's the myth. It doesn't really exist in reality. People are not showering exactly at the same time. So you don't really have that problem. You have a lot of myths. We, we need to get facts to kill those wrong myths and, and make the right solutions, uh, which is a benefit for everybody. And of course, we want to make some of the learnings, because when we do these uh, experiments, small scale experiments, of course, we get something working, and we get something not working perfectly, uh, like control of buildings are not always done the right way, and we have to do something more about that, and we have to improve it before we realize it in full scale. And we need to, to look, look into what is the distribution cost of this, because let's face it, our competitor is a heat pump, which produces heat for the building locally using electricity, which is anyway, which is going to be used for those buildings not in an urban area. So the structure of the IA report is those uh, elements, cost of distribution, planning of the network, um, safety of domestic hot water as a main technical issue, domestic hot water installations, new types, heat force uh, through the distribution network, use of low temperature supply for um, low energy buildings and for existing buildings and make use of uh, low temperature heat sources. And a number of case studies. So here are the seven case studies presented in the report, illustrating some of the uh, possibilities, some of the difficulties, and making it perfect. And we still have to work on making some uh, small uh, improvements to make it almost as what we want to have it to work, typically. Major conclusions, we can distribute um, 
heat to the buildings of the future, which is not really using a lot of heat. Low end the buildings have a very low consumption of heat. Um, typically building in 2020 in Europe will have a consumption for space heating, which is maybe only half of what is used for domestic hot water. Today we are using two, five times more for space heating than we are using for domestic hot water. So buildings in future will have the possibility to get rid of almost all of the space heating, except for the cold winter time. That's a nice thing for district heating, because then you get rid of the most of the peak load heating. Peak load is a disaster for economy, because you have to have the capacity, you have to have it ready, but you're not really using it all the time. So it's much better if you have a system that can work on constant load, like the domestic hot water, every day, every uh, year, constant uh, amount. So it's uh, going the right way. And, and of course, you have to make the system cost uh, up to that. Uh, but uh, our investigations show that this is possible to be competitive to the alternative. You have to do uh, planning because it's very important that when you do district heating, you have the houses in an area covered to district heating, so you don't have every second house being district heated and, and the other are heat pump heated because 100% um, uh, houses should be connected to the network when you have the network anyway. Domestic hot water, yes, you have solutions, you have problems, but let's face it, and that makes the solutions. And we, we can have new solutions, which is much better, both for safety, concerning the weather, and for performance of, of the system. You can have um, low temperature to residential buildings. Um, first, and you can have it even in relatively low density areas. In, in Denmark, we have uh, tradition for a long time to have district heating in suburbs where single family houses with low density uh, heat load is heated by district heating. And that's where of course you have a challenge, but you can make, if you make use of the better new technologies, you can also make that even that area uh, heated. Of course, if you get too far away from the network and, and low density is not a good idea, of course you should stop where it's not a good idea. But you can go even to the single family houses in sort of area and keep them the district heating. And that will be like 60, 70, 80 percent of the buildings in the country. So you have district heating as, as a major solution to almost all buildings. You can make the network uh, efficient, and you can make use of low temperature heat sources. And having low temperature as the possibility, you have a, a lot more heat sources available and at a much lower cost and a much uh, more uh, easy to find the sources and, and also have them for long term. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for that, uh, uh, Sven. Uh, uh, really fascinating insight to uh, the so-called fourth generation district heating. Um, again, there is time for a question from anyone. Yes, please. Uh, yesterday we saw a China example, which is quite amazing. And I'm um, not so sure that they are dealing with the low temperature. Uh, to be more precise and accurate, and have better understood, can you characterize, can you define what is the low temperature? In, in our definition of low temperature district heating, we say the supply is uh, 55, the return is 25. That means that you can supply uh, domestic hot water according to the standard rules. Yeah. If you don't have a tank and a circulation. Even if you have a tank. Depending on country. Yeah, yeah. But that's... 55. Yeah. That's okay. 
my second question, I can. That is uh, how to handle the uh, pipe size with variable temperature. The bigger the pipe, the higher the distribution cost, uh, pumping cost. So, how do you face that? The, the, the analysis of heat loss and pumping cost shows very clearly that if you can if you can minimize pipe sizes and you can accept all the pumping extra pumping costs you can have, the limit is not the cost of the pumping. It's always better to have more pumping costs because then you get much lower heat losses. The limit for that is actually that you have a certain max pressure in the loop in the set in the in the network. So I think in future we will see in order to have optimized uh, smaller dimensions and you will have local pumping in the network because that's a benefit for the minimizing of the heat losses and the pumping is such a small energy consumption anyway. Yep, second question, please. Ask uh, very nice uh, and interesting presentation, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, when you said that it is uh, possible to have this type of pipes for residential building. And uh, my question is, um, is, do you mean inside the building and, or outside the building when it is coming in? Actually, when you have uh, what we call flat stations, a substation where you have a domestic hot water heat exchanger and, and the control for, for the room space heating, then you can actually run into the building your, your pipes from district heating. So yeah. the district heating pipe actually continues yeah. up in the building. And my second question is, how do you think that we can integrate these pipes with the existing pipes? Um, well, this is of course something you have to do mainly in new buildings and buildings which is going through a deep renovation. Uh, you, you're not going to integrate, I mean, you have, uh, if you have an existing building with an existing circulation for, for domestic hot water and for space heating, then of course if you want to implement a local production of domestic hot water, then you have to take away the original pipes, but you have to do that anyway sometimes because they have degraded. Yeah. So when you have to renovate those network in the in the buildings where you have circulation of hot water and, uh, and space heating water, then you, the chance is to make a new and better solution. Yeah. And may I ask one more question? <laughs> How uh, have you actually uh, investigated the long-term properties when they use in this application of this pipe? No, we don't have long-term experience yet, but uh, maybe it's good to do But, but we, we often use existing technology. So when we use district heating pipes, it's the same conventional technology that has been used for many years. We are just saying, let's please have smaller pipes. But otherwise, the rest of the technology is exactly the same, and therefore we say, okay, the only thing we do is we, we lower the temperature, and you know, then you'll have certainly Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question, anybody? Yes, please. Uh, one question regarding uh, local production of uh, domestic hot water. I understand this is supposed to be done by a heat pump. No, no. No? No, no, no. no. Certainly not. So? <laughs> so. No, no. So what, what, what kind of uh, technology? Heat exchanger. Heat exchanger. Small, compact, flat plate heat exchangers with a heat transfer capacity of uh, 30 kilowatts with a temperature difference of 5 degrees. So you can come with your 55 degree hot water from the district heating network and you can take the cold water and heat it up to 50 degrees, 45 at least, depending on where in the network you are. Just compact heat exchangers. That's that's really really simple and and cost efficient, and you don't lose energy from a electricity okay. network. Okay, so uh, for the ultra low temperature, the yes. supply is 
the way five. When you when you go below the comfort criteria for hot water, 40 degrees, yeah. uh, if you have uh, abundant resources uh, of low temperature dish, uh, heat sources at 30, 35, 30 degrees, you could use that for space heating. In future houses with more heating, 30 degrees is surely enough for heating the rooms. And you can preheat the cold water, and then you have to supplement that supplementary heat to, to rise the cold water from 30 degree to 40 degree can be done by direct electricity, can run, be done by a heat pump, depending on what is the optimal solution, which, which is something we are working on. But we need to do much, much more work to find the optimal solution. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sven, for that again. Um, and uh, so I want to move on to um, our fourth uh, uh, project, which is going to uh, be uh, presented here by uh, Maria Yusto Alonso um, on this uh, topic of this universal calculation model. So um, I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I'm very pleased to be here representing all those people uh, that have been working very hard on this project. This project uh, started actually, and uh, we cannot just say it's only the resource from the Annex 10, but also takes into consideration a lot of the work that was done in the Annex 9, also regarding calculation and model, uh, actually calculation for primary energy factors CO2 equivalent, this reheating and cooling. Uh, the team, as you see, is formed by two European institutions, Synthet Energy Research in Norway and Estet in Sweden, and the third one is Korea Dish Reheating and Cooling. We tried to do this tool that was supposed to be universal, and therefore uh, it was supposed to be a good balance between Europe and non Europe. More or less, we try our best. And we, I think it was a little bit European dominated that way. Uh, also, part of the results that are used in this uh, calculation tool are coming from the PhD thesis of Monica Werner. So, what have we done? We have done a lot. We have uh, developed a universal, well documented, and transparent method for calculation of primary energy factors primary energy use and emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, it sounds very round and very nice. And uh, what is the meaning of that? We wanted to do a tool that everyone could use for calculation of these three points. It could be used, or our goal is that it can be used for people that are planning to build a district heating network, district heating cooling combined with a power network. Uh, and that can be also used for people that has already one and for the common legal requirements we have to give these numbers. Uh, what we have delivered to the annex it was first a, a documentation of everything that lies behind the tool so that people can understand which are only default values that I will come back afterwards. Uh, we thought that it would be easy for everyone to get a user manual. So this was the second delivery. And the third one is the tool that I will go back to illustrate afterwards. Well, uh, we were so lucky that we got this project, and I think it's because most likely we got a lot of pressure from the legal framework to work on it for many reasons. We had uh, the Energy Performance Directive in building that was saying something uh, that energy certificates must have an energy performance indicator and a numerical indication. What is the meaning of that? Who knows, but we think that it's primary energy use and CO2 emission. Then uh, CN uh, ES 16503, whose uh, name I don't remember right now, uh, was saying that, uh, well, you are until now calculating these primary energy factors using power bonus methods. And finally, you get 
negative value. What to do? Okay, it's over saying that it's negative. I will come back to that in that location then. Then we have the pre standard, up to my knowledge, this is still pre standard, 15603, that uh, comes back to the, and it's much more clear. It says that we need three primary energy factors that are the total, the renewal, and the non renewable. And that these three, they have to be calculated in the same. They also say that we have to introduce the renewable share, the renewable share and the, this we try to do it. So a little bit, this is the framework, and in addition, we wanted to do something that was according to what other people were doing. And there is Eurohit for Cities that was developing a, I would say, a parallel project that was very similar in goal, but the boundary is a little bit different. You were talking before about that the house has to be inside, well, we take it outside. We have, we will calculate primary energy use from the production until the boundary of the house. And why? Because, well, so the, this is the definition of the primary energy use, but in addition, because we have this, all these new standards, 15603, that are going to explain how to calculate it. And it was too much for us, for this to uh, so, this is a little bit our boundary. We start in the primary energy, and then we take into account the production of it. Then we take the fuel to the generation plant, and we will take into consideration the construction and dismantling emissions, and also the ashes, we will take them into account. In the standards, it's not clear that we need to take them, so for the tool, I will come back to that. We will give the possibility to use them or not. The same applies for our business. Then uh, we go to the district heating network. And again, we consider the, the pump and the construction of these mounting uh, emissions and uh, Then uh, we wanted to introduce as well the cooling, district heating and cooling. So we have the absorption chiller and the district cooling network. And here is our model. <coughs> Uh, this is a little bit what is behind the tool. Um, uh, what we have done is we have created a database, both in this PSP thesis and the previous annex, uh, where we have been working a lot in pipelines, FTAs, insulation, how this affects the emissions, the same for the load, for the type of fuel that we are using, that is very European based, uh, the allocation method and the system boundaries, that is what I have explained. So a user will come and say, well, either I know what I have sent this year, and I know how much I have put into the power plant, so I know my lodging and so on, or maybe it's only thinking, so what to do? Should I have a one meter pipe, half a meter pipe? How is this going to affect? A lot what the friend was looking now. And the same for the technologies, uh, which type of cooling, for instance, are we using? or whatever. And with that, she is going to take, uh, he will get the, the results of the primary energy factors, both renewable and total. The non-renewable is the subtraction, the total and the renewable, so we let it for the engineers to calculate. And then the CO2 emission. Heat losses and heat losses, we also calculate them, but we assume that uh, depending on which user we are talking, may know more about heat losses than we do with our default values. And yeah, what we are going to calculate, or this is the total primary energy consumption, the total primary energy factor, the renewable primary of the primary energy consumption, and the renewable part of the energy factor, and the emissions of CO2. This is how the district heating looks like. Um, I kind of went through it before, so I don't go so much into detail right now. And this is how the district cooling looks like. Uh, in the previous work, we have not presented anything about cooling, so I think it's uh, maybe interesting to show it more now. And uh, this is a, this is how we are calculating it for the tool. So we have different types of uh, on production. We can have uh, absorption, absorption production, or or compression systems. And we went a little bit into detail on that. So made our boundaries and we 
then make the calculation. This is a typical sketch where we're using a mechanical uh, cold production. This would be very standard condition in this machine pump. Uh, we also include this. Sorry for the noise then. Uh, this is a, another uh, type of uh, cooling production that we have introduced in the tool, and this is when having absorption uh, cooling and mechanical cooling. And finally, uh, if we have free cooling, it looks like that. This is how the tool looks like. Now, probably it's uh, the right time to talk about this a little bit more, as I have made it so many times. So, we see. Number one, delivery energy. This is what the owner of the plant knows how to do. Then, point number two is the combined heat and power possibility to specify. So we can introduce details about the fuel, we can introduce details about the uh, with, uh, combined heat and power plant. I will come back to the tool in one second so that we can click everywhere. Uh, the third point is the DC heated network. We will uh, give some uh, information to the tools for calculation regarding losses and regarding piping. The point number four is the sealant. So which type of cooling system do we have? Because this is going to affect how the arrows move. And the fifth point is the DC cooling net. So how the distribution of the cooling is going to be given. Point number six is the fuel data. Here we can introduce uh, a lot of details regarding the data because we know that it's also European. Uh, the, the axis and additives can be described here, and the user has the possibility to use them or not. And then the allocation method. Finally, when we are done with uh, introducing all this information, we will just go here to the calculation and the report that says. So, maybe I show it in reality how it looks like. Here it is. I'm sure it cannot get any bigger. So, so, I was thinking that maybe it's good to give you an example, because it's the same example that we have in the user manual, so that we can go stepwise and I don't have to forget anything in how to do it. So, the question is uh, the first example is to calculate a district heating network with cooling option, we will have a delivery heat of 100 gigabytes per hour, a delivery cooling of 0 0.5. We will use a, food, a fuel type that we call wood chips. Uh, the, combined heat, the combined heat and power type will be a DC steam cycle. The sealer type that we are going to use is a absorption and mechanical. And we will have some information regarding the district heating and district cooling. The DC cooling, DC heating and cooling net is actually 60 years old. Yes, so let's just try to do it. And keep it a little bit so the numbers are clear already. So this is the delivery heat, the 100 gigabytes. Uh, we will introduce here the delivery cooling. Uh, then we will go here to the fuel combined stand power. And we will introduce first how many how many uh, plants do we have in the system. So that's why we will have one. We will be only one. So they have 100% of the relative weight. And then we will introduce all the details regarding fuel. And they are here. We have uh, ten different uh, ten even more different uh, fuel possibilities. If we choose this, uh, we use the defaults that we are we have been calculating for European case, uh, or the most, uh, the most Swedish case. But if we have something else, we can uh, define it here. Um, after that, if we use a different fuel here, uh, we have to go here to the fuel data and define how to do that. So we say like the which is its primary energy factor, so then you have a primary energy factor, the efficiency, the alternative production, and, and all this uh, information that we would need. 
uh, I don't know what it's looking for green right now. I guess it's the lightest. So, uh, in any case that uh, we, we were a user that had been selling for the whole year and we wanted to calculate the, the values for this year, we could introduce here a different uh, power, to, power to six ratio. And we could use it in the calculation here, just by clicking here. So it would forget everything else that may be contrary somewhere. Yes? Then uh, we can define the axis here. If uh, the, normally we, we have defined the, the axis uh, through their transportation length, how many kilometers, and we can use them or not. So in this case, we don't use them, for instance. And we have to decide which allocation, allocation method we are going to have. Uh, these are the ones that we have introduced in the calculation. So the energy method, should I go a little bit in definition of what we have in any allocation method? Or I assume that everybody knows this. Yeah. So, yeah, I say for the time. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we can decide here, and, and depending on what we choose, we may have to give some further information. So for example, if we were using the recent method, we would need to introduce some, some more information regarding temperature levels and uh, uh, for the supply of the return flow and also for the environment. Or if we were giving something like the power run, we would need to give some information regarding which mix are we going to do. We have calculated all these mixes, but we give also the possibility to have uh, Also, the possibility to have a different replacement. Yeah. So, uh, once that we have defined all these things here, we can go to the risk switching net. So, give some further information regarding how are we using our risk switching plant, which is the duration plant of the time of the plant, which is the maximum load, uh, how is the share of the demand divided through the year, uh, how. How is the density of the area that we are supplying? And uh, which are the, uh, here are the default, default heat losses, but uh, we can also introduce them. By clicking here and changing them. In addition, we can also give some further information regarding the, the distribution, which are the type of dimension of the pipe the size, the number, and all the information that we need. And this would be used to calculate the heat uh, uh, ratio drop. So we don't see it now, but these values have changed. But they didn't change because I think I didn't change anything, but they did change. Uh, regarding the chiller, here we, we can introduce which type of chiller we have used. Uh, if we have, for instance, mechanical absorption, and, and this is the design capacity, the POP of the chiller, and the different information that we would need. And once that we have introduced all the details, sorry, here we can also uh, give some information regarding the district cooling network. That would be more or less the same information as for the district switching network. So when we have introduced all the information, then we just have to say, calculate the CO2 equivalent and primary energy losses, and this is what we get. So divided in different uh, parts, like 300, 50 children, and uh, we can give primary energy uses, but or also primary energy factors. Uh, just to finish it, we can give a, a report so that we can uh, generate something that the user can, in case that we, it was needed to deliver it the authority, we could use this one, where the user will get all the information about the choices that it has taken. And more or less, this is what we have done. It's a, I guess not so little. And yeah, I go back to the presentation. 
Uh, I was thinking to show a second, a second exercise. Do we have time? Yeah. Uh, this is a second uh, example where we are having two uh, production units. One is a C commodity and power steam cycle where we are producing steam and cooling, and uh, sorry, uh, heating and uh, electricity, 22 gigawatts. And uh, we have also a big boiler that will be natural gas in this case. So coming back to the tool, we can calculate everything. So for the first, we have to give some information to the tool, saying that we have several units. <coughs> so we just have to go here. Uh, by default, we haven't choose any allocation method. So we have to choose one. Uh, in this case, I follow the exercise that we have in the, in the, in the user manual with the energy method. Uh, we wouldn't need any further information regarding the line of the energy system. We don't remember it anymore, but we are producing 100 and, 150 gigawatts. And regarding cooling, we are producing zero. And in addition, what we have different here is that we know that we have a different uh, power to rate, power to heat rate. So we don't want to. We will have this. Uh, still, we will have this uh, uh, production unit, but we will change the production, the heat power to heat ratio. So it was 100, and we were producing at the same time 22. And then we will calculate a new alpha value. This is the one that we are going to use in the calculation. Then, uh, well, let the, the first unit is defined. Then we can go to the second unit and define it. It was uh, natural gas. And, uh, In this case, we are not going to do this in Just for not going too much to detail, we assume that the district electricity network is the same as previous. So in this case, we just have to calculate it like this, and we get the value for the two production units. OK, and then this was my last slide. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, go for it. Hey, uh, a question already. Oh. Thanks very much. An interesting uh, model and presentation. I, I have two questions. Uh, one relates to the emissions in the power grid. And it looks like you had individualized country values for replacement mix. Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the composition of those numbers? Uh, obviously, this is a very important variable. Uh, particularly if you're looking at, do I want to do heat pumps? Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm wondering, uh, uh, is this the, the average for the grid serving those countries, or have you tried to look at the, uh, at, uh, the marginal plants, so to speak? Uh, it's the average value, but I think we took into consideration the, the marginal. I, I can take it in the theory guide, but they're explaining in detail. So before lying to you, I prefer to take it in the theory guide that I have in the book. I wouldn't want you to lie. <laughs> and, and, and secondly, uh, in calculations like this, it's, uh, this, this, this is very useful. Oftentimes, the, the questions are being asked about primary energy uh, because uh, people want to look at district energy compared to the building systems, individual building systems. Is, was there thought given to a 
sort of complementary methodology that would allow you to say, well, here's the profile for the district system, and this is how it compares with people putting in, for example, their own. We have some tests on that. Uh, we talked about the uh, that dynamics, that work group, but uh, we didn't have uh, a the possibility to take it into consideration. Uh, yeah, question? Uh, just a question for a technical one. What is the software you have used to do to use it? To develop the tool? MATLAB. Yeah, we, we decided that MATLAB was the best free simulation software. We just have to, when we deliver the tool, we just have to give it the compiler huge time, but otherwise, uh, just install that one and then double click in the in the tool and, and then it's very easy. In addition, if you have the possibility to watch, modify the tool. Other question? No, all done. So well, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, introducing the uh, tool and uh, hope you all managed to use it to uh, to benefit. Um, I um, would just like now, before we go on to the next session, to um, really thank uh, all our presenters, the four project uh, presenters uh, from today, um, for the uh, presentations. They've uh, they've given us so hope you're joining and uh, just giving them some joint applause. <laughs> and so that uh, really brings to uh, an end the um, uh, part of the end of Annex Seminar, dealing explicitly with the Annex Ten projects. Um, this uh, small piece of time until the uh, lunch is available. Uh, is then uh, available for uh, questions about the program itself. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session, uh, we can take those in two ways. Uh, initially, if anybody here has any questions at all uh, about the uh, program, I will uh, endeavour to, um, to answer them, perhaps with assistance from other um, uh, members of the executive committee um, and uh, when that is through uh, then both myself and uh, Heiko over there will be available for any questions that uh, uh, you may have on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis that um, uh, you know very specific things you prefer not to answer ask in front of uh, the whole audience so the first of those then, uh, any, would anybody like to ask any questions about uh, the program here and now? Okay, well, that, that's fine. <laughs> um, so uh, that means uh, really that I declare the uh, session uh, closed in terms of uh, you as a full audience, but I uh, say again, anybody who wants to uh, remain behind to speak with Heiko and myself uh, about the program, I suppose I'm particularly uh, angling this towards uh, people from countries who are not uh, members, who are maybe like to explore a little bit more, find out a bit more about what we do and how, then we are uh, available at this time. Uh, for everybody else, I guess Lunch was available at 12, so it might be a little bit of a wait outside. And do you want to perhaps just say a word? No? Okay, yes, uh, I will just uh, uh, check that out. So. Okay, so um, uh, 
uh, the, the, the food is not yet uh, there, but I think I can uh, declare uh, this session um, uh, closed. And thank you very much all for attending. Um, anybody that wants to see Highcomb, uh, myself, please uh, just um, just do so. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you.